I've had plenty of time slips in my life. You know, times where the beginning and end are way further apart than the middle can account for. Like a 10 minute walk taking 4 hours, that sort of thing. I've kept them to myself because, well, I was the only witness, and if we're speculating on something supernatural versus me just being crazy, well. I don't like my odds. This is different, though. This is multiple witnesses, same story. It was New Year's Eve. My husband, two kids, 13 and 9, and I were staying in a motel. We planned to watch the fireworks from the balcony at midnight because we were in city center and they'd be all around us, but that was hours away. The sun had just set and the sky was a misty purple. I was making dinner, sliders, which at that point were 20 minutes from done. As I was setting up our plates, we started hearing fireworks. I checked my phone for the time, it was a little after 7. The fireworks kept going off in the distance and the kids were getting excited. They went out on the balcony to look and asked me to come out. I kept assuring them they were cool, but the real show started at midnight. I started to wonder myself after a while, though. The fireworks just kept going, more rapid than I expected for 7 in the evening. I went outside and saw bursts of color exploding all over the sky. I marveled at it. If this was 7, what would midnight look like? Then I checked my phone again. It was 12.15. I couldn't even tell you what I did after that. I was initially disappointed along with the kids and confused along with the kids, but the more we thought about it, the weirder it seemed. We'd all witnessed the sun setting literally an hour earlier. I'd started dinner while it was still light out and it was still hot and just barely ready. I'd checked the time and did the math for them how long it would be while the sky was still purple and the fireworks just kept going. It went from 7 to midnight in a few minutes. I don't even have a wrap up for this, I don't know what to say. I'd blame it on my phone, like the clock being off, but that can't explain midnight right after sunset. We're in Utah, not the Arctic Circle. Husband works overnight so he's used to time feeling weird and that's what he chalked it up to. Son took it in stride because he's young and time travel is his jam. Daughter and I are the ones wondering years later WTF happened. She'll bring it up whenever there's a special occasion and I'm cooking, like neither of us can trust when something should be done anymore. We both wait on events like we might miss it, because we know we already have before. TLDR, I instantaneously transported to my old home, in a very specific location, for no real reason. I'm new to Reddit so I'm not sure exactly where to post this. Apologies if this does not belong, and for the length. This was the weirdest experience I have had to date, and I still get choked up and emotional when I think about it. It was 2010 and I was 25 years old, living at home with my very supportive parents who were helping me through college, after previously dropping out of high school and having two amazing children. It was an early autumn afternoon, around 4 to 5 p.m. I was in my room, doing some homework on my laptop, at my desk. The desk faced the wall directly across from my bed, and my older style box TV was on top of my dresser to the left of my desk, about two feet away. I was, as usual, procrastinating doing my homework, so I was mindlessly watching some dumb TV show. Because my TV was so close, I stood up instead of using the remote to change the volume on my TV. As I reached out my left hand to press the button, as if a switch flipped, my entire environment changed. This affects me still to this day, I still feel it in my soul that something strange happened. I didn't hallucinate, it was real. I was back in my childhood home, some 20 miles away, and seemingly 18 years in the past. I was standing in front of the only hallway closet in the one-bedroom house that I grew up in. The house was over 100 years old, and the closet was one of those with the doors that slide open on tracks. You know, the ones that the doors never go back on the tracks right, so you must be careful of how you open it. 
Anyway, the door to the closet was open, and my already outstretched left arm was reaching toward a very distinct item. When I was little, my mother had this perfume bottle that, for some reason, I was absolutely in love with. The perfume itself was cheap and didn't smell particularly good to me. The bottle was glass, and shaped like a bird, maybe a dove. Its wings were up and outstretched. It was beautiful, but it had a broken wing. I probably broke it, being the curious and clumsy child I was, and still am, lol. So, there I was, one moment in my somewhat modern bedroom in 2010, the next in the old one-bedroom hallway across the county, back in time 18 years. I was there, I saw the bird bottle. I was within inches of grabbing it. My heart melted for that dumb little bottle of stinky perfume shaped like a one-winged dove. Oh my god, this is not a Fleetwood Mac song, I swear. Before my hand could actually make physical contact with that precious bird, the switch flipped again. I was back in front of my TV, outstretched left hand and all. My mind could not comprehend what had just happened, and I felt immediately sick and dizzy. I was in such a state of shock and confusion that I just walked out of my room, down the hall, into the living room and out into the front yard. I could do nothing but lurch over, hands on my knees and try desperately to catch my breath, but mostly my sanity. This experience was so jarring, so real. I was physically in front of that open closet, reaching for that damn bird bottle, then I wasn't. I wasn't particularly stressed about classes, it was community college. I'm not prone to hallucinations and was stone cold sober when this experience happened. I've only told a few people because honestly the subject of momentarily teleporting through time and space doesn't come up in conversation often, and I only know a few people that I can tell. Has anyone had anything like this happen? I still have no explanation and it might have just been a weird break in psyche, but it was not a dream, and I was not under the influence of anything or under any unusual stress. Your experience, and you slash disturbed serenity, have me questioning an experience I had around 2013. I thought it was a past life flashback, but maybe it's considered a glitch? I was exhausted starting a new business and was preparing some things to ship was going to run into a store for shipping supplies, and as I crossed the pedestrian crossing into the big box store I heard a plane fly overhead. Something with the engine was off, so I looked up to view the plane. At that point I flashed to another time, and was standing on a hill, wind blowing, overlooking the ocean early morning and I saw three Japanese bomber planes flying. I knew it was Hawaii and I knew in my soul, it was the start of Pearl Harbor. I was confused about my change of location, and looked down at my body. I was wearing a nurse uniform with white stockings and white shoes. After that the sound of the plane engine skipping brought me back to present day. It felt like minutes and no time, all at the same time. My dad was with me and noticed no change and I didn't say anything besides, the plane engine sounds like it's skipping. So I missed no time in his eyes or else he would have called me out. I've always avoided war anything, books, movies, etc. BC it makes me incredibly uncomfortable and emotional. Like, leave the room can't watch a documentary uncomfortable. So I was completely ignorant about Pearl Harbor. I googled nurse uniforms of the time, and it matched what I saw. Lastly, I've never hallucinated or had any mental issues. However, I have had a lot of loss, nearly died, there was a glitch there too. The time of my wreck, the clocks in my house stopped at the same time of the crash, in my life and am open to there being more to our existence than what we know. Let me start by saying I worked in an assisted living center for the elderly. This is not a ghost story. At my job we had one partner with us on every shift. This night I was working with Jessica. We were doing the swing shift, 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. I was in the kitchen cleaning up the grill after dinner and I see Jessica cleaning the tables in the dining room about 5 feet from me. 
I ask her if she wants to put another pot of coffee on or if we still have enough from after serving the residents. She doesn't respond, which is unusual because we weren't having a bad night or fighting or anything. I ask again and don't see her in there anymore. So five minutes later, Jessica comes down from a hallway and I say, hey, wait, where were you? She says she was helping Helen to bed. This is a common task for the time of night and takes about 20 minutes because she has severe dementia. I say, that's crazy. I swear I saw you in the dining room while I was cleaning the kitchen, but it couldn't have been you actually. The person I saw was wearing a pink sweatshirt and sweatpants. As Jessica is standing in front of me, I can see she's wearing a black top and blue jeans. She turns slightly pale and her mouth dropped open. Finally she says, that's what I was wearing last night. This lady from across the street gave us three bags of clothes she didn't want anymore and I picked out the pink sweatsuit and put it on last night to see if it would fit. Then I kept it on for the rest of the night. So the tale stops here, because I'm pretty freaked out over this. The kind of thing hasn't ever happened to me before in such an obvious way. First of all, let me say I live 20 minutes drive out of town and I only worked there on weekends. I was not even in town the night before when Jessica was on shift. Also, that outfit she got was new, to her anyhow, so I wasn't using a remembered image of her if my eyes had played a trick on me. I had known Jessica for about three years by that point and she wasn't one to lie or weave stories for amusement. I am still freaked out over what could have occurred. But, I know what I saw. The peculiar case of three boys who disappeared on an October morning still baffles many today. They were supposed to be doing a simple map reading exercise in which they would travel the four or five miles to the indicated place, then return to the starting point and report what they had seen which should have been the charming Suffolk village of Kersey. Nonetheless, the more the cadets considered it, the more they questioned whether or not something peculiar had transpired to them. The young Scotsman who headed the expedition, William Lang, described the place as a ghost settlement, so to speak, many years afterward. It felt like we'd taken a step back in time. Although I thought heavy grief and depression at Kersey, I also got the distinct impression that I was being watched by unseen entities. A part of me wondered who might have answered the door if we'd pounded on it with a query. There's no point in considering it. The Journey of the Cadets Perthshire native Lang has never been to the east of England before. The same might be said of his pals Michael Crowley, a fellow Worcestershire native, and Ray Baker, a Cockney. In fact, that was the point. The three recruits had only turned 15 when they enlisted in the Royal Navy. That way, the training officers could verify that the trainees had found the village they were tasked with finding simply by comparing their accounts. Afterward, Lang and Crowley, by then both residents in Australia, put the matter to rest until the late 1980s when they discussed it by phone. As it turned out, Crowley didn't remember as much as his old friend Lang, but he still thought something strange had happened and recalled the eerie quiet, the absence of aerials and lamps, and the peculiar butcher shop. That prompted Lang to contact Andrew McKinsey, a prominent SPR member and author of a book Lang had read. McKinsey was intrigued by Bill Lang's letter because he thought it might have described a retrocognition, the SPR term for what we would call a time slip incident. After examining the evidence, he came to the conclusion that the three cadets may have witnessed a previous version of Kersey, one that no longer existed in 1957. Two years of letter writing back and forth with Lang and some library research with the support of a Kersey historian cemented that opinion. In 1990, Lang took a flight to England to retrace his steps. A case of the time slip? This is an intriguing instance because retrocognition is one of the least frequently reported phenomenon forms. Only a handful of cases have ever been documented, with the Versailles event of 1901 being the most well-known. On this particular day, the principal and vice-principal of St. Hugh's College, Oxford, were exploring the grounds on the outskirts of Paris when they had a series of experiences that led them to believe they had witnessed the gardens of the palace as they had been prior to the French Revolution. They did some digging and came to the conclusion that one of the people they saw could have been Marie Antoinette, Queen of France and the wife of Louis XVI. Mackenzie came to very similar conclusions after investigating the Kersey incident, 
and he made it the centerpiece of his book on retrocognition, Adventures in Time, 1997. The cadet's experience seemed real to him because of the apparent sincerity of Lang and his buddy Crowley. Ray Baker was also named but turned out to recall nothing of the encounter and the detail of their recollections. Mackenzie was particularly pleased by the fact that the property Lang had identified as a butcher's shop dated back to around 1350, was still used as a private residence when Kersey was revisited in 1990 and had been used as a butcher's shop as early as 1790. As the cadets neared the settlement, the author was startled by the dramatic change in season. Inside Kersey, Lang observed, it was verdant, and the trees had that wonderful green color one finds in spring or early summer. There was also the mystery of the local church, which Lang pointed out the party had missed after entering the village, and the hush fell. The absence of a church was something he remembered very specifically. He wrote, Since my line of sight encompassed the entire room, I would have been able to see it. Crowley also recalled that there was no church or tavern. This was hard to understand, given that the 14th century St. Mary's, Kersey, is the district's most prominent landmark, visible to anybody walking along the main street. Mackenzie built his argument on St. Mary's past and used this discrepancy to estimate when Lang and his party visited the town. Percy Mackenzie noted that the Black Death, 1348-9, which killed half the population of Kersey, halted the construction of the tower. He reasoned that the cadets may have seen it as it had been after the epidemic when the shell of the half-constructed church was obscured by trees. Mackenzie further stated that the most likely period was C.1420 when the church was still unfinished, but the community was growing prosperous from the wool trade. This is because Lang and Crowley recalled that the village buildings had glass windows, a rarity in the Middle Ages. This was hard to understand, given that the 14th century St. Mary's, Kersey, is the district's most prominent landmark, visible to anybody walking along the main street. Mackenzie built his argument on St. Mary's past, and used this discrepancy to estimate when Lang and his party visited the town. Percy Mackenzie noted that the Black Death, 1348-9, which killed half the population of Kersey, halted the construction of the tower. He reasoned that the cadets may have seen it as it had been after the epidemic when the shell of the half-constructed church was obscured by trees. Mackenzie further stated that the most likely period was C.1420 when the church was still unfinished, but the community was growing prosperous from the wool trade. This is because Lang and Crowley recalled that the village buildings had glass windows, a rarity in the Middle Ages. Loopholes in the story. Indeed, it is an intriguing narrative. Is there, however, another explanation for the events of 1957 when viewed through the lens of a historian? If there's one thing that needs to be said about Kersey, it's that it's the kind of location where a group of strangers would have been thrown for a loop upon first arriving. With its long history, it was first referenced in an Anglo-Saxon will see point nine hundred, and its many surviving medieval structures, the village has become a popular setting for filmmakers and has been called the most charming village in South Suffolk by no less an authority than historian Nikolai Pefsner. A number of thatched, half-timbered houses and the Bell Inn, which dates back to the 14th century, are among its highlights. It's not hard to envision how these eye-catching relics could stick out in a witness mind more than the more mundane architecture surrounding them, leading to the eventual conclusion that the location they saw was much older than they had first thought. It turns out that there is a very reasonable explanation for the cadets' seeming lack of vigilance regarding cables and aerials in Kersey. Not until the early 1950s did the village get linked up to the mains, despite the worries of the Suffolk Preservation Society, which fought fiercely to preserve the community's skyline. The British parliamentary files also support the accuracy of this information. But what about the other particulars? When I initially read Mackenzie's story, the mention of windows made me nervous because glass was expensive and, therefore, scarce throughout the 14th and 15th centuries. It's possible that Kersey was an outlier due to its riches during this time, but it's puzzling that so many of the town's dwellings were apparently unfurnished if that was the case. The boy's depiction of an abandoned settlement, as it would have been in 1349, contradicts Mackenzie's rich village of 1420, which is just one of many issues with the chronology. Still, the thing that troubles me most about the cadet's narrative is something Mackenzie didn't consider. Whether or not a medieval community would have had a butcher's shop, 
The majority of rural people ate a vegetarian diet due to the high cost of meat, and the few times animals were slain in a hamlet for a saint's day feast, maybe they were eaten right away because of the difficulty of keeping them fresh. Evidence suggests that beef was rarely eaten. In the village of Sedgeford, in nearby Norfolk, only three cattle were slaughtered yearly around this time. This is despite the fact that meat consumption increased dramatically in the late 14th century from a tenth or less of the food budget to a quarter or a third of the total. Given that Kersey had its own weekly market, where fresh meat would have been accessible, and that it would have offered severe competition, the thought of a shop keeping two or three whole ox corpses in stock as early as 1420 appears highly unlikely. This leads me to believe that there must be another explanation for the cadet's observations. Derealization is a psychological condition where one's surroundings appear unreal, as in the Versailles case. Several aspects of the occurrence strongly suggest a sense of derealization, including the lack of sound and activity. It's also notable that the witnesses don't seem to agree on anything. Remember that Roy Baker remembered nothing out of the ordinary regarding Kersey? However, there is still no explanation for the striking degree of agreement between Lang and Crowley, the two cadets. It is no wonder this case still fascinates so many today. I assume this was paranormal phenomenon at first, particularly a mimic demon, but a comment brought to my attention an alternative explanation and I'm curious as to what people think. So in the past two-ish days there has been some strange things going on in our house. Things that just don't add up. First thing that happened was when I was getting out of the shower. My boyfriend came in as I was drying off and handed me a pair of my panties. I thanked him but told him I already had a pair with me in the bathroom. He said jokingly something along the lines of, you yelled at me to bring you these, you better take them. I assumed he was just being goofy so I took the panties and told him to get out of the bathroom. The next bit came within the next few hours. My roommate was getting ready for a date and called me from her bedroom to zip her dress up for her. I went into her room to find that there was nobody there. Notably that, but she walked out of the bathroom shortly after wearing jeans and a tank top. Nothing that she would have needed my help zipping. I told her about what I heard and we checked her room out. Her TV and computer were turned off. We were just confused. Around 11 p.m. my boyfriend and I went for ice cream and to watch a performer play and then returned home and fell asleep. My roommate made a comment when we woke up that she could hear us having sex and something along the lines of, you must have been getting good the way you were shrieking. I asked her earlier today around what time that was and she mentioned it was around midnight, which is when we would have been out of the house. Not only that, but we didn't have sex at all on the night in question. The last thing that happened was when we were doing our evening meditation. Through the closed bedroom door we could hear two people talking. We couldn't make out what was being said, but we could hear the actual talking clearly enough. Naturally I jumped to the conclusion that somebody was in the house. But then something slash someone addressed us directly through the door and said, night y'all, while gigging and walking off. It sounded just like my roommate and it's worth mentioning that when me and that my boyfriend are in bed together, that's something she says and does through the door to mess with us. Does this sound like a glitch? Could this potentially be a time slip? Like do you think it's possible that somehow past slash future incidents just found their way here or got caught in transition? I know this sounds far-fetched, but I honestly don't know. Also we are having someone check for carbon monoxide tomorrow and someone checking for mold later this week. Promised I'd post this story earlier on. Way back in 2004, I was living with a friend in England. We used to go walking in the countryside, out in the fields and all that. One time we were out walking, we spied a mini forest type thing toward the edge of a field. Curious, we went over to it. As we approached, we noticed a little pathway slash gap in the trees, so we followed it. As we went along through the trees, the pathway became like an archway, as if the trees were growing into the perfect shape over the path. This went on for ages, maybe half an hour. Eventually we saw daylight at the end, so we powered on along and made it out of the exit into open air. Outside looked normal, 
countryside, with the exception of a strange settlement before us. It looked like the buildings were made out of junk, well, wooden junk. There were tiny people, four foot, maybe five foot max, everywhere wearing rags. They were all muddy and unkempt. They stared at my friend and I like we were aliens from another world. There wasn't a road, just a muddy path through the center of the buildings. No power lines, nothing modern. While standing there, I suddenly had this feeling that I had to leave. I said to my friend that we had better go, so we went back the way we came. It was a pity this happened in 2004, since we didn't have the tech to hand easily that you'd have nowadays to take photos and videos of everything. Anyway, we went back and discussed it a few times in the intervening months. Eventually, I couldn't stand it anymore and convinced my friend we had to go back with a digital camera. When we returned, we found the trees and the entrance, but when we followed the path, it lasted a few minutes and emerged into another field. A normal field. We walked the perimeter of the trees, turned out to be just a little square of undeveloped slash and used land in the middle of four fields. No archway. No village. Suffice it to say there was no point taking photos. I'm convinced to this day that if we hadn't left when we did, we'd still be there, wherever or whenever there is, to this day. Another missing persons report. This incident occurred in 09 or 10 and at that time I was living in a small house in the oldest neighborhood in our town, all late 1800 slash turn of the century type charm. Forgive the wordiness, but I feel it's necessary to include a little detail about my street for frame of reference. My house sat two houses from the corner and directly across the street from a small park. Right across the park from us sat my youngest son's best friend's house. It was a cute little place for a single mother with two boys and I never had any problems there, even though it was one of those neighborhoods where one block is cute as a button and the next can be a slum. So I'd say it's about 10 o'clock on a weeknight. I'm just coming home with my sons in the back seat, roughly 12 and 7 at the time, and we're approaching the corner just ahead of my house. The intersection is a four-way stop with the park to my left and my house two houses up on the right. As I pull up to the stop sign we see a figure standing on the corner on the park side. He has his back to us and he appears to be an old man. He's hunched over so we can't see his head but he's frail and thin in body and wearing what looked to be tan slacks pulled way up, old man style, and a short sleeve white button down shirt tucked in. Now mind you, my headlights are shining on him and there is also a street light on the opposite corner, so we can see him clear as day. It's a solid figure and there is no mistaking it's a man. I'm sitting at the stop sign and we're watching him for maybe two or three minutes and I don't want to move because he's just so damn unsettling. I don't want to go up to the house in case he follows us as I am defenseless so we just sit there at the intersection watching him. It's not so much there is a man standing on the corner that's disturbing to me. It's the way he's moving. He's just sort of shuddering, but in a real herky-jerky sort of way. Sort of like when your cable or satellite starts to glitch and pixelate. I'm wondering if it's just me seeing this until my 12 years old whispers, what the hell, and I look back and the boys are slack-jawed trying to figure this thing out. So then I think I'm just being stupid and it's probably just some poor old man that has dementia and wandered away and maybe he has Parkinson's tremors or something and as I am about to tell the boys I'm going to let them in the house and go back and see if he needs help, he turns around. And here is where I do my best to describe to you what I saw because this shit is about as indescribable as it gets, it is, in fact, not an old man. He turns around quickly, faster than I can register, but still kind of in a stunted manner. I know that probably doesn't make much sense. He has a full head of reddish brown hair parted in the middle. He's thin and he is in fact wearing slacks pulled all the way up and a button-down shirt much like a stereotypical image of a nerd, minus the pocket protector. Like I said, he isn't old but I can't say how I know this because it's like his face isn't, finished. He looks right at us but with indiscernible eyes. I think the best way to describe it is, it's like if someone painted his face in watercolor and then smeared it down and at an angle, but I can still make out some expression of shock or surprise on that face.
The boys and I all scream and jump back in our seats and then he spins back around again in that jerky stunted way and takes off in a sprint, faster than I have ever seen anyone move, away from us and as he's running he begins to sort of, I don't know, dematerialize. From the feet up he just sort of ceases to exist and then he's gone. Saturday morning. I'm at home, in my front room, watching soccer am. It's a normal day, I am not hungover, or ill in any way. But as I am watching TV, I suddenly get the worst headache I have ever experienced. It was literally crippling, I felt like I couldn't even move. I remember thinking to myself, just close your eyes, and wait for it to go away. So I do. Next thing I know, I wake up in bed. I remember it clear as day, I was not dreaming, I was now wide awake. Still a little headachey, but feeling much better. I assumed that I must have gone upstairs, probably with my parents' help, and slept it off. But that's when things started to get strange, although I was wide awake, I immediately realized that I was not in my bedroom. In fact, I didn't even recognize the house. Now, again, I would like to stress that I was not dreaming, this was absolutely real, at least it felt real, and I had no memory of how I ended up in this room. So there I am, collecting my thoughts, and I realize that I can hear noise coming from downstairs. In fact, it sounds quite lively, I can hear music and laughter and talking. But I'm really worried, because I don't recognize the room that I am in. In any case, I decided that staying in the room would do me no good, so I ventured out. I walked out onto a hallway, and it was immediately obvious that there was some kind of get-together going on in this house. At this point I still didn't recognize where I was, but it did feel familiar. Especially because I recognized most of the people stood in the hallway. The first person I came across was my uncle. I remember him asking me if I was feeling better. This was starting to make sense, but I was worried that maybe I was suffering from some kind of memory problem, so I played along like I knew what was happening. Yeah, I replied, much better. You okay? I then proceeded to have a good chat with him about work, home, the usual. Anyway, as I'm leaving him, he says to me, and I will never forget this, thanks again for having us round tonight, really enjoying it. Now this is really weird. And it's at this point that I'm starting to suspect some kind of prank or trick. I was definitely not dreaming, it was all real. I can picture the house clear as day, laminate flooring, a old-fashioned staircase, and a really nice kitchen. So I move through this party, recognizing maybe 80% of the people. But there's this one girl who is staring at me, and I don't have a clue who she is. This is when I'm really beginning to get suspicious, as something is definitely not right. Even the people I recognize just seem different. Okay now here's where it all kicks off. I guarantee you are going not going to believe the next paragraph, but I swear down, this happened. So, I talk to a couple more people I recognize, and eventually make my way to the entryway to the kitchen. Next to the door to the kitchen, there is a small chest of drawers, with a newspaper on the top. I pick up the newspaper for one reason. Not a headline, or a picture, or anything else. The date. Saturday March 31, 2018. Now, please, if anyone can explain this I would appreciate it. My immediate thought was that this must be a prank. I was so scared when I read the date that I just stared at it for what felt like minutes. I didn't even read the actual headline. I remember it had something to do with trains. I remember looking for one of my friends nearby to ask them, when a hand lands on my shoulder. It's the girl who had been staring at me. She pulls me into the kitchen and closes the door behind us. This girl say that she's not sure if I am playing a trick on her, but about an hour ago I had told her that I had a headache, and that when I returned I needed her to give me a note. So she hands it to me. She tells me, if this is a joke it's not very funny or believable. Then, she walks out of the kitchen. Now, I am not going to relate everything that was on the note, because some if it was very personal. 
Basically it was a list of about 5 pieces of advice. I will share the first and the last. The first piece of advice was warning me of a message I would receive from an ex. It said to completely ignore the text, as if I replied anything it would lead to trouble. There were then three other pieces of advice that were very personal. The final thing simply said, stop panicking, in about 10 minutes you will be wondering if any of this even happened. I read that piece of paper about 100 times, and then stuffed it into my pocket. I then remember getting that same headache again. I left the kitchen, and went back up to the bedroom. The last thing I then remember was seeing a picture next to the bed of me, and the strange blonde girl from downstairs, on some beach that I didn't recognize. Next thing I know, I'm stood in the kitchen of the actual house where I live now, 2010, talking to my mother. I have no idea what about, but I get the impression that we were mid-conversation. I promptly proceeded to write as much of what happened down as I could before I forgot anything. That's what I've based this post on. I do not know what this experience was, but it was not a dream. I think it must have been a hallucination, because I am given to understand that hallucinations feel completely real. My only doubt is that there was no reason for me to hallucinate, I was not ill, drunk, on drugs, or tired, or anything. The weirdest thing, two days later I got an out of the blue text from my ex weird. Last weekend, my partner and I were walking home from the grocery store. It's about five to six blocks from the store to our house along a fairly busy main road. We are walking and happily chatting and both start smelling a strong smell of pipe tobacco. We start talking a bit about how we like the smell of pipe tobacco and how it reminds us of a night we had way back when we first started dating. We are also both looking around to try and find where the person smoking a pipe is. To our surprise it is two men smoking cigars on the side of the road. It seemed a bit weird but oh well, I suppose a cigar and a pipe can smell the same. We pass them by and they both look at us. As we pass them everything goes a bit weird. They start saying some kind of vaguely aggressive things, I can't remember exactly now but it was something like, my god, in plain daylight, or something, and we both had the feeling it was somehow directed towards us so we don't look back and keep walking. At this point we both realize everything has gone very quiet and there are no cars passing us by. The cars up ahead aren't moving and the main thing we can hear is a cafe at the end of the block playing some sort of French piano music at the top of the street. Someone on the other side of the road, that we can hear but not see, is completely freaking out, screaming and just going mad. Everything felt so deeply unsettling to both of us and we comment on the quiet and how it's so odd. We reach the end of the block where the cafe is and it's like we have been thrown into a wall of noise. We hear the cars and they all start moving past loudly. Bikes start going by, ringing bells and basically all the city sounds come back in full force. It was so incredibly jarring to go from this unnatural unsettling quiet to everything back to normal, suddenly. We spoke about it and both experienced this as the exact same way. I also had an inexplicable feeling that we had been in a different time for that moment. Not sure why it was just a feeling. We walk home feeling a bit unsettled. We also pass two guys on the street who look exactly the same, with messed up freaky, inhuman faces, that gave off extremely aggressive vibes. We again had the same feeling of, this isn't right, but maybe it was because we were already feeling weird and it was a few days before Halloween after all. We get home and our son acted like we had been out for ages. I checked on my phone when we had checked out at the grocery store and the walk that usually takes 10 minutes took over 30 minutes. I don't know what happened but even a week later I feel shaken by it. I actively avoided walking down the same block during this week. It seems so small but we were totally freaked out by it. It all just felt so wrong and sinister. Time slip experiences from the depths of YouTube. I found these curious personal accounts buried among the 900 plus comments on a very run of the mill time slip video on YouTube and felt they deserved a wider audience. Mystic Mama underscore 3692, 
one year ago, something similar happened to me and my husband. I was driving him to work, which was a 20-minute drive without traffic. We were running late and were starting to freak out a little because there happened to be heavy traffic that day in our tiny little tourist town in the Smoky Mountains, so my husband called his employer and told her we would be a little late. When we pulled up in front of his work, we looked at the clock and only 10 minutes had passed since we left the house. We even checked the time on our cell phones to make sure the car clock wasn't just off, and sure enough it had only been 10 minutes since we left home, which is impossible. We felt weird, and couldn't explain it, but he got out and went inside for work. It gets weirder though, when I got home, which took 28 minutes from heavy traffic, he called and told me that his employer said he'd never called her and told her he would be late, which we both remember him doing so when we realized we wouldn't make it on time. It is still one of the craziest experiences I've ever had to this day, and it still makes me feel strange when I think about it. Meet Mupith 3 RD, two years ago, I have a health condition which warrants me going to a neurologist at least once a year. I was 22 when this happened and had been seeing the same doctor in the same building since I was like 16 or 17. So I drive up, park, and go up to the door. It's locked, and absolutely nothing was inside. No chairs, no desks, nothing. There wasn't even a marking on the door to signify what the office was, but I'd been there enough to know I had the right door. Thinking I was just losing it, I went to the next office over. Their doors were also locked and the inside was empty. All eight or so offices on this building were vacant. I thought it was weird and went home, assuming they had moved and forgot to tell me. A few hours later, they called to make sure I was okay. I said I was, I just hadn't gotten their new address. The lady was super confused and told me they'd been in the same place forever, which I found out later was since the 1980s. So I told her I'd attempted the doors, as well as looked inside, and the place was locked totally vacant. She said she hadn't seen me at the doors, as I was the only person due and during the hour I was scheduled to be there, and she recommended I go to the emergency room because I guess I sounded like I'd had a stroke or something, who knows. But she was very concerned. Anyway, after that I didn't go back there for about two years because I was worried I'd slipped from reality and they were onto me. When I finally returned at the ripe old age of 24, last year, the office was in its normal spot. The spot it's always been. I still don't know what happened, and I'm not sure I want to know. DC 4644, two years ago, I experienced a so-called time slip once. I was in the St. Louis airport one morning, about 5 a.m., back in the 1980s, when I passed a newsstand on my way to the gate. I stopped and looked and there stacked in a wooden honor box, were newspapers on the floor next to the newsstand. It was almost full to the top with papers, about two feet tall. I looked down at the front page and it had the next day's date on it. I found it mildly curious at the moment and continued on to my gate. After learning my flight had been delayed, I went back to the newsstand for reading material. The newspaper box was completely empty. I went in and asked about them and the lady behind the counter said, oh, we won't get those for about another hour. I didn't mention that the ones I saw out there were dated for tomorrow but I did say the box was full just a few minutes ago. She said that wasn't possible as she signs for them every morning when the dealer drops them off. Weird shit. Dibhine 6809, two years ago, myself and my uncle Peter experienced a time slip about 30 years ago. We had been to a classical music concert in Preston, UK, a place where we went once a month. The car park for the venue was sort of underneath the concert hall and there was only one way in or out of it, about one quarter of the way down a road. So to get in or out of the car park, you could only drive down one stretch of road, which was in the center of town, always busy at night a full of shops and bars in the bottom sections of the mostly Victorian buildings. After the concert, we got in the car, left the car park and began driving down the road and realized it was deadly silent and everything looked strange. We stopped in the middle of the road, engine idling and looked around. There were no other cars at all, the streetlights were old-fashioned and appeared to be gas, and there were no shops or bars, just rows of houses. There were no road markings or street signs either. 
We looked at each, completely spooked and to make sure we were both seeing the same thing. We drove slowly down the rest of the road and decided to go around the block and drive down it again. Once we popped out of that street, everything was normal, so we drove around the block, got to the top of the weird street we had just left and began driving, everything was back to normal, shops, bars, cars, people etc. This incident was amazing and we always talked about it and I often think about it to this day. The image of the Victorian street is stuck in my mind like a piece of film, it was so incredible. I don't really know what to call this. A glitch, a time slip or just a weird coincidence, I'm really not sure. I'm from West Yorkshire, UK. I am a 27-year-old woman and this happened in 2010 when I was 15 and I remember it as if it was yesterday. Here's my story me, my mum, grandma and friend all went to a local coastal town for the day. Somewhere we had been many times before, at least three to four times a year because we have got family who live there. Ever since my mum was a child, we have always traveled the same route through the countryside rather than the motorway because we like to stop off at what we call a halfway house to grab a sandwich on the way there and a drink on the way back. We always stop at the same places because it's just part of the routine and what we have always done and enjoyed. On this particular day, everything was normal, we had driven to the coast, stopped off for a sandwich, the sun was shining, it was a normal lovely day. However, on the way back was when it got weird. We set off mid to late afternoon because we wanted to miss all the evening traffic and to make sure my friend got home at a decent time. The journey felt normal. We traveled on the same roads as we always had and was planning to stop off at the usual pub for drink, non-alcoholic. In the space of about 5 to 10 minutes we noticed the weather had really changed, it had gone from being a glorious warm sunny day to being grey, overcast and quite cold. We didn't think much of it and then my mum said, oh I don't know where I am. Confused, we just said she must have taken a wrong turning but she was adamant that she has been on the same road for the last 8 miles, a road we had traveled countless times. We wondered if the road had been altered since the last time we visited because now, none of us recognized the road or the surroundings. We looked for familiar landmark that would hopefully guide us in the right direction but there was nothing but fields for miles. We began to notice that the road we were on was very quiet and we seemed to be the only car driving along it. Nothing had passed us in what seemed like ages. Me and my friend began to get anxious because of how weird this felt and we were worried about being lost. My mum calmed us down and said told us not to worry and that the next village we drive through we will pull over so she can set her sat nav up. In 2010, phones didn't really have maps or anything yet, not like we do today anyway. About 10 minutes later we saw a couple of houses in the distance, as we approached we noticed there was two semi-detached houses, a small farmhouse and yard, an old-fashioned level crossing for trains and a pub. My grandma suggested we pull into the pub so my mum could set up her sat-nav and we could have our halfway house drink while we were there, to help calm our nerves. We entered the pub, it was empty except for an old man in a rocking chair in front of a burning fire. He stopped rocking the chair abruptly and stared at us as we walked in, as if in shock. He was wearing brown work trousers with braces, black boots, a cream shirt with a knitted vest, a flat cap and was smoking a pipe. As if he stepped straight out of 1910. He didn't speak, just stared. We approached the bar, the barmaid slash landlady was walking behind the bar and halted in her tracks as soon as she saw us, again as if in shock. We asked if the pub was open due to it being so quiet and she said, oh yes, yes it is, what can I get you? We all asked for soft drinks, me and my friend being underage at the time, my mum being the driver etc. The lady scrambled around getting us the drinks then looked baffled when we tried to pay with bank cards. She used paper and a pencil to add up the cost of our drinks so we paid with loose change to make it easier for her. To the right of us was a narrow staircase and down ran a little girl around the age of 7 or 8. She was wearing white tights, brown brogue-like shoes and a burgundy pinafore-style embroidered dress with a hand-knit cardigan and her hair was in ringlets. She gasped and also looked surprised to see us and looked between us and the lady behind the bar, presumably her mother. 
we thanked them and took the drinks outside to one of the wooden tables. The man in the rocking chair began to rock again and watched us intently as we walked out. We sat down outside and with hushed voices, spoke about how weird that whole situation was. We noticed how there wasn't anyone else around. No other cars in the car park, no other people in the pub or beer garden and no people walking the streets near the houses. The place seemed deserted, abnormally quiet and stuck in time. As we quickly finished the drinks a man in a van pulled up, got out, got a pickaxe and spade out of the back and looked over to us and said ooh visitors and went inside the pub. We got back in the car as quickly as possible and left and within a matter of minutes we were on a road we all recognized and the sun was shining once again. The whole thing was so bizarre and unbelievable. It's all we could talk about for the rest of the journey home, we were trying to understand the situation. The unrecognizable roads, the old-timey clothes and the overall feel of the place and how the people reacted when they saw us, as if we were aliens. So that's my story. The memory of it all is still so clear and I'll never forget the expressions on their faces. We still talk about it to this day, 12 years later, all our memories so clear. It was possibly the most strangest experiences of my life and I feel like I wanted to share my story on here to get others' opinions and if anyone had experienced anything similar. Thanks for reading. Rathana 7, 2 years ago, I experienced a time slip one Easter. I was about 9 years old, and was playing outside. We wandered into a part of the woods we generally avoided, and there were these gigantic, ancient, empty snail shells lying around that I'd never seen before. They looked very fragile, and I didn't want to break one accidentally. Going back the next day, prepared to collect one of them, I found, the snail shells had all vanished. Not a speck remained. I decided that I had somehow been transported. This happened over 55 years ago, but it's still a fresh memory. I came in Osakaman, two years ago. When my dad was younger and was solo hiking in the mountains of southern Japan, he saw hundreds of samurai in armors, carrying swords, and also carrying injured people on their backs. Nobody believed him, and my family still makes fun of it, but he is not a kind of guy to joke around like that. Geminil 2415, one year ago, I had a time slip no more than 11 months ago. It wasn't spooky, it was just strange and unexplainable, and it was just a slip forward of about 25 to 30 minutes. With two of my sisters I had been to a gathering of family and friends at my brother's house, as we often do. My younger sister lived not too far away from him so we were staying the night at hers. My husband was picking us up the next morning and dropping my older sister home. We'd had some breakfast and were just sitting at the table drinking coffee and talking. I was seated next to the window looking over her small garden. Her dog, which was lying down, suddenly was running to the door barking madly at someone there, automatically glanced out of the window, and saw my husband struggling with the gate to get in. The gate is usually bolted and the bolt is difficult to reach without standing on a small ledge of wall, my sister has it this way to prevent anyone getting into her garden and stealing her dog. The sister sitting next to me was rising to go to the door. I told her it was okay, it was just my hubby, so, I'd get it. I could see him quite clearly, it is a very small garden, so, he was only a few strides away. He was standing on the stone ledge leaning over the gate trying to reach the bolt. I walked the few steps to let him in. I thought he had stepped off the wall as he had seen me coming but when I opened the gate he wasn't there. I looked both ways along the pathway, no sign of him. I then thought he must have gone back to the car for something. I went under the archway to the front where the car gets parked. There was no hubby and no car there. It was freezing cold so I hurried back and thinking to hell with him. They looked at me closing the door and asked was he not coming in? I said, he's not there. They said, what do you mean, he's not there? Where is he? I told them I didn't know where he'd gone to but he wasn't there and I wasn't standing outside in the cold looking for him. We were puzzled but just went back to our chatting at the table. About half an hour later the exact same thing happened. The dog was up barking and going mad just as before, 
and I could see him there struggling with the gate again. As I went down the path again I stopped and looked at him. I said, here, I've just done all this before about half an hour ago. He was still standing on the ledge. He didn't know what I was talking about. You were here, I said, at the gate, trying to get in the same as you are now. You were wearing your exact same clothes and hat and then, and then you disappeared. He just looked bemused and said he'd just come now, what was I talking about? My sisters know it happened, I know it happened. Your guess is as good as mine. Early two, one year ago. This happened to both my mother and I in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. We walked down the wrong road thinking we were walking up to the Crescent Hotel which is noted to be haunted. Anyway, we were hot and thirsty and we passed a shop where a man in old clothes was making windows the old-fashioned way. We thought he was simply demonstrating the process as happens in a lot of historical places. We went inside the shop and used the restroom and got a cup of lemonade for an unusually small price. Then we chatted with the lady and our conversation went to her display window. She was so happy we noticed her handiwork in window dressing. Let me show you my last year's Christmas display, she said. She proceeded to pull out a black and white photograph trimmed around the edges like they used to do way back when. The picture showed a 1930s car and a window full of old dolls. It was not a set-up picture to look old. By this time we were both getting a very odd feeling and finally managed to end the conversation and leave. As soon as we left, things returned to the present, circa 1989. We looked back. The shop was empty. We walked really fast back to the car and went home. The Plataf, six months ago, I was traveling in India in the Tea Hills and found lodgings in a town called Udi. Sitting in the lounge room, I heard a game of tennis being played outside and decided to find if we could hire rackets. I asked the manager and she said there were no tennis courts there. I pointed in the direction that I'd heard the sound of balls, and she smilingly told me that there had once been a tennis court. Back in the 1930s, it had been dismantled during WW2. Next day, I went for a stroll and listened to the sound of bagpipes. As India has still a lot of British influence, I was expecting to see a Highland band probably with men wearing turbans as well as kilts, and waited and waited, but no band appeared. The kindly manager informed me that British military had been stationed in the hills, and maybe I'd heard their ghosts, or perhaps I'd been in Udi in a past life. I'd love to know. Healing Dan Growth in 4677, one year ago, I do believe it is residual, haunting. I had an experience when I was a teen, I saw the whole, sequence of a condemned man, walking to the gallows, with carriage, cage, horses, blue-dressed policemen, all the nasty, aggressive, angry, hateful, crowd. They appeared and disappeared before my eyes, and I did rub my eyes to make sure I was okay. The sky changed from wet, and, cloudy to sunny, and, bright instantly too, and then instantly back to wet puddles, rain and clouds. The man and woman in old-fashioned clothes were the only ones who looked at me. I believe the woman was the mother of the boy going to be executed. She, I don't blame her, looked at me with anger and the man with sideburns looked at me gently, with reassurance. I believe he knew I wasn't one of the crowd. I couldn't move much from the spot I was in to touch anything as it happened around me. To be honest, I would have stopped what was about to happen to that poor boy. I felt so helpless, it must be how the boy's parents felt, but I felt at the time, why show me if I can't change it? I wonder if he, the man with sideburns, was showing me what happened. Maybe the female was trapped, repeating it out, maybe the man was needing my help to free her from the past to move on in spirit. Makes me wonder now. They were very much aware of my presence. The scene played out like it was happening that day. Spirits must be caught up, even stuck in residual haunting. It isn't just atmosphere memory. Anger 3819, two years ago, it happened to me and my boyfriend of the time, back in the early 1970s. We knew there was something not right but didn't know what until we passed a small inn we had been in, and, noticed, it was closed by 9.40 p.m. We mentioned to a local it had closed early and he told us it had closed down five years before. 
There were other odd things, too much to write here. There were a couple of times in that hour or so we had both felt in mortal danger. Freaked us both out. Strange thing is, the barman took decimal currency and shouldn't have. When my then boyfriend bought drinks at the bar, he gave and received decimal coinage. I have read accounts of the same happening to others. We didn't consider at the time but maybe it was a shift to a different dimension rather than time travel. If there hadn't been two of us I would have put it down to imagination. I never want to experience that again. I wouldn't wish it on anyone as it was very frightening. Frank and Carol. In this first tale, Frank set off with his wife to go shopping in Liverpool back in 1996. His wife decided that she wanted to go and buy a book at Waterstones the large bookstore, and they started to walk towards the area of the shop. As they approached Bold Street, Frank decided to go to another shop first, but bumped into a friend and stopped to chat in the street. His wife went ahead without him. A few moments later, Frank said goodbye, visited his shop and turned to go back to meet his wife. After reaching Bold Street, he headed on towards the bookstore. As he approached, he glanced up and was surprised to see the name, Crips above the door. As he was about to cross over to see what was going on, a van swept past him with the name Cardenz on the side. The van drive honked his old-fashioned horn and drove past. Looking around, Frank suddenly realized that things were not quite what they should be. He looked at the cars driving past and realized that they were all old-fashioned vehicles such as people would drive back in the 50s and 60s. And then he noticed the people. Men were wearing hats and macs, and the women were dressed in headscarves, full skirts and had old-fashioned hairstyles such as women wore just after the war. By this time, Frank was beginning to feel slightly freaked out. He carried on crossing the road and headed towards the store. As he got closer he noticed through the window handbags, shoes and umbrellas. Suddenly he saw a young woman standing looking totally bemused, up at the shop sign. She was wearing modern clothes and as she saw him approaching, smiled at him. Frank went into the shop, closely followed by the young women. When they entered he was surprised and pleased to see that it had indeed turned back into a bookshop. The young women smiled, shook her head and said, that was strange, I thought it was a new clothes shop. Then she walked away looking extremely puzzled. This may sound an unlikely tale, but the odd thing about it is that Frank was in fact a former police officer who was used to dealing in facts, and definitely wasn't the type of person who would believe in the paranormal. Frank never stopped talking about it. Was this a time slip? Evidently Cripps was a women's shop that sold clothes and other goods, and Cardenz was also a well-known Liverpool firm that owned vans around the time Frank found himself in. Imogen and the Mother Care Store The second story concerns a young girl by the name of Imogen. She had decided to go into Liverpool to buy her sister Abigail a few things for her new baby. Upon arriving she was happy to see a new mother care store that had opened up on the corner of Lord Street and Whitechapel. She wandered around the store and picked up a few baby items such as cardigans, baby bibs, and gloves. She was surprised to see how cheap the items were but thought they were on offer as the store had just opened. Taking them to the counter, she tried to pay with her credit card. The staff member looked at her suspiciously and went off to get the manager. When she came back, she looked at the card and told Imogen that they didn't take cards. So, disappointed, Imogen went and put the items back as she hadn't any money with her. When she got home, she told her mother what had happened. Her mother was surprised and really puzzled. That store closed years ago, she said. There is a bank there now, in fact that's where I have my account. Not believing her, Imogen took her mother back to the same place the next day. Sure enough the store wasn't there. It was a bank, just as her mother had told her. In this tale, Imogen couldn't have gone back to the 60s. The reason being that she would have noticed the money was different. In England we changed from sterling to decimal currency in the 70s. What time did she go back to? Good question. A thief goes back to 1967. The third tale is of a young man named Sean, who, while shoplifting in Liverpool back in 2006, ran away from a security guard and headed down Hanover Street. Trying to shake of the guard, Sean, 19, turned into a dead-end street called Brooks Alley. 
By this time he was out of breath and started to get a tight sensation in his chest. He soon realized that actually it wasn't a problem with him, but the atmosphere around him. He waited for the guard to come around the corner after him, but he never appeared. So, thinking he had given him the slip, he sauntered back out and started to walk down Hanover Street again. But he soon realized that something was wrong. The road looked different and so did the pavement. He noticed cars driving by that looked very old-fashioned, and the road works that he knew were there were now gone. Soon he saw that the people around him were wearing strange clothes. Crossing over to Bold Street, he noticed that there were traffic lights where there weren't before, and bushes growing around the Lyceum, near a bar that he recognized. He carried on walking, realizing that actually something was really odd. Then he began to panic. He realized that somehow he had stepped back in time, and the time slip was not going away. Then he remembered his cell phone. Taking it out of his pocket, he tried to get a signal, but of course it didn't work. Eventually he began to really panic, but spotted a kiosk selling newspapers and headed over. Leaning over the stand, he took a look at the front page of the Daily Post. There in bold lettering was the date, May 18, 1967. He wondered what to do. What happens if he can't get back to his own time? What about family and friends? So, speeding up his pace, he reached H. Samuel the jewelers and tried his phone once again. This time it worked. Sighing with relief, he looked around and realized that he had returned to the present. But the strange thing was, he could still see, down the end of the road, people still walking around in 1967. By this time Sean had seen enough and dived onto a bus to go home. When he was interviewed by the local newspaper later, he stated over four times the exact account. Now, you may think that Sean was making the story up to escape from the guard. But the strange tale didn't end there. When the security guard was interviewed, he stated that when he ran after Sean and turned down the dead-end alley after him, he said that Sean had completely disappeared. When the newspaper checked out the facts of Sean's story, they found that everything he said was historically accurate. Linda's story. This happened to Linda on Bold Street around the late 90s. I stepped out of Central Station next to the Lyceum and put my foot on the road to head across to Waterstones. In a split second the scene changed, and a handsome cab went past me heading towards the cathedrals, followed by lots of people in what I can only describe as being like the people on the Quality Street tins. I'm hopeless at history so I don't have a clue what era they were. It was the hats I noticed most as I tried to take in what I was seeing. The ladies wore bonnets with brims and the gents wore top hats and dark suits. Several couples walked straight past me as if they didn't see me. I immediately thought I must have walked into a film set but there were no cameras about. And anyway I couldn't have because when I stood on the pavement everyone was in the present time. Yet as soon as I stepped onto the road, everything went into a different dimension. At first I was confused and scared. And then just really scared as I thought about what would have happened to me had I been unable to step back into the present time again. Another Bold Street slash Liverpool time slip. I've seen one of these time slips and can give a first-hand account. When I was 20, so about 24 years ago, I was making my way through Liverpool to see my girlfriend. I needed to catch a train from Central Station, which as you may know is right in the area of Bold Street. So as usual I walked down the large ramp that led from Bolt Street, you can see it on Google Street View, into the station and towards the entrance at the far end. Causally glancing around I wasn't really paying much attention. Man on a mission. My lady was waiting. I shot a look to the right and registered something odd straight away. My pace slowed though I kept walking. There on the right was a cafe slash coffee shop. It had sprung up out of nowhere. At the time I thought it was odd as my girlfriend and I often went to places around there and only the other day had walked down the same ramp and that cafe was definitely not there then, and neither had anyone been working on any such shop either. To make the situation even stranger, everyone in the shop and the few that were sat outside were all dressed in very old clothes. I'm guessing now looking back on it around the 1900s, the women that I saw were wearing large hats and looked very out of place. My first thoughts were, is something being filmed? and maybe it was a special day the cafe was doing and everyone was getting dressed up. So I just put down my lack of noticing it there before as being one of down to age and not really paying attention. I've changed. Smiley face. 
I glanced ahead to make sure I wasn't going to walk into someone and when I immediately looked back, the cafe was gone. At the time I just put it down to me being weird but it was only recently that I heard about time slips and made the connection and it bugs me to this day that I didn't just walk over to the cafe and talk to the people there. However, I was really freaked out and whilst others have said, I'd ask someone to look me up, I can assure you that the actual event is so disconcerting that you don't think along those lines. The first emotion you experience is fear and an overriding sense that something is very wrong. It is odd that others don't seem to witness the event at the time and I'd have thought that such activity would be recorded on the CCTV in the area, of which there is loads. My theory is that it is you that is transported in time, hence the story of Sean the Thief in 1967 where the guard reported that he just vanished. This would explain why the event it limited to just the one person but also explains why nothing would be found on any CCTV footage. I'm certainly convinced they exist. Had I not seen one with my own eyes, I, like probably so many others, would just put it down to various other factors and chalk it up against odd stuff that people believe in. Mr. X Mr. X used to work on Bold Street in Liverpool. He was walking one day about 10 years ago down Renshaw Street, then turned by Rapid, into the lane that takes you across the railway line and emerges by the borough bar. Mr. X had worked in Liverpool for a while and knew the shops well, noticing the ones that closed down such as Collinson's, leaving empty shoe stand displays and hat stands still in the window. Mr. X carried on walking. He was going to meet his wife in town that Saturday afternoon, but as he walked onto Bold Street, he noticed that Collinson's appeared to have reopened as the window was full of shoes and hats as it had been a while previously. He also noted that catchpoles appeared to be on the other side of the street, where it had been some years before prior to moving to a site across the street. He turned to go down Bold Street and noticed that all the cars appeared to be 10 to 15 years out of date, but all appeared new. He then noticed that all the shoppers seemed to be wearing unusual clothes, not dramatically old, but fashions from 10 to 15 years before. He assumed that there was some event on in the city that weekend. The street also seemed unusually quiet. There were sounds, but they appeared quite muted. The Oz Factor? Mr. X carried on and met his wife outside the bank on Hanover Street. They went in and attended to their business. Everything in the bank seemed normal. But when they emerged, Mr. X was surprised to notice that everything had returned to how he expected it to be. The empty shops were again empty, and Catchpoles was back to where it had been the previous week. Mr. X is unsure if the scene changed back to normal as he and his wife entered the bank, or as they emerged, but as the bank appeared normal we assume things changed back as he entered the bank. His wife, who had not been on Bold Street, had not noticed anything different that day. Mr. B's Lady Friend Mr. B had a lady friend who was very much a skeptic concerning matters of the paranormal. In the 80s she worked in Liverpool City Centre, and if the weather was pleasant, she would sit outside and eat her lunchtime sandwiches. One particular day, being sunny and warm, she decided to sit on a bench which was situated diagonally opposite Waterstone's bookshop on Bold Street. As she sat down, she noticed that the sun did not seem as bright as it had been moments before. In fact, looking back in later years, she described the light as similar to when the area had a partial solar eclipse. She also noticed that the street did not seem as busy as it had been, which struck her as unusual for the time of day, 12.30 p.m. being the height of lunch hour. She sat down next to a very smartly dressed man who was already sitting on the bench and started to unwrap her sandwiches. The gentleman engaged her in conversation, and they chatted about inconsequential matters, as strangers do. As they chatted, the thought crossed her mind that although smart and very amiable, the man next to her appeared to be dressed in an out-of-date fashion, reminiscent of the fashions popular in the 1950s. As they were chatting, the man asked her a question. As she replied, she leaned forward to put her sandwich wrapper in the waste paper bin to the side of the bench. She took her eyes off the man for a split second as she dropped the wrapper in the bin, but carried on replying to his question. On sitting up again, she was astonished to realize that the man had completely vanished. She immediately scanned the area for him, but he was nowhere in sight and could not have run off in the split second that she had taken her eyes off him. At the same instant, the sun returned to its ordinary brightness and the area was crowded with people once more. Grandmother at Central Station, Liverpool
Central Station in Liverpool has changed much over the years. Before its last major upgrade, trains used to come into the station and were shunted down to a dead end, then came back up the other side of the station. Passengers came out up a long stairway, then on turning left they emerged opposite Casey Street. One day, Mr. B was going down the stairway on his way to catch a train. This was in the 1960s, and it was five or six years since his grandmother had died. Mr. B's grandmother was an unmistakable lady. She always dressed in old-fashioned clothes. More suited to the 1930s, however, she was always smart and very prim and proper. As Mr. B descended the packed stairway, he caught sight of his grandmother going the opposite way, leaving the station. He stared in amazement and blinked a couple of times to make sure he wasn't seeing things. Sure enough, the lady was his grandmother. No one else could be mistaken for her as she was so unique in dress and style. He tried desperately to reach her, but the stairway was so packed with people he could not fight his way through. He saw his grandmother turn left at the top of the stairway, going towards the exit, and at the same moment a gap appeared in the crowd. Mr. B instantly took the opportunity and ran through the crowd and round the corner. But his grandmother was nowhere to be seen. There was nowhere she could have gone in such a short time, even if she had started to run, and being in her 70s when she died, this was not something she would have been expected to do. St. Luke's Church At the top of Casey Street are the remains of St. Luke's Church, which suffered major damage in the May Blitz of Liverpool during World War II. One evening about 11 years ago, Mr. C was in Liverpool city center. It was December, and he had been to the hi-fi shop which was situated at the top of Bold Street. He was now on his way to meet a friend for a drink before going home. The weather was cold, and the streets were icy. Mr. C made his way to Casey Street, then turned down the side of the church. As he passed the church he looked up, and was surprised to see that all the lights were on inside the church. He thought how unusual it was, as the church was derelict, not even having a roof. Occasionally there was a light shining in the porch, but nothing more. Mr. C was amazed, but assumed that the church had been renovated since he had last been past it. Shortly before Christmas, Mr. C was again passing St. Luke's. However, this time he noticed that the church was again in blackness, and was derelict and locked. Later, Mr. C read Tom Sleeman's story of the church, and his blood ran cold. One from the 1950s. In the 1950s, Mrs. P worked in Crips in Bold Street, now Waterstones, as a window dresser. At the time, there was an equipment room in the basement of the store. The store employed a commissionaire, an older military gentleman, six feet tall and thin. He always proudly wore his wartime medals and sported a walrus mustache. He had been at the relief of Khartoum, so was advanced in age at this time. Mrs. P hit it off with the commissionaire and they became good friends. One morning, Mrs. P went into work to find her friend was not there. It transpired that he had been taken ill at home and had been taken into hospital. Mrs. P carried on work as normal and went for lunch as she normally did. After lunch, she went down to the basement. She heard a cough from the top of the stairs and recognized it instantly as her friend's cough. He had a very distinctive cough much as you would imagine an upright military gentleman's cough to be. She was very pleased at the thought that her friend had obviously recovered and returned to work, so she ran up the stairs to where her friend used to hang his coat. She was very surprised to find nobody there. Later on, she discovered that she had heard the cough at the exact moment that her friend had died in hospital. Thingwall. Mrs. P had recently moved to Thingwall. Her daughter was about four and a half, and she had taken a poorly turn. As it was a fine sunny day, Mrs. P decided to take her for a walk in the pushchair, to give her some fresh air and also to have a look at the area which she did not know yet. She went up Mill Lane, opposite the primary school. The lane she walked down was tarmacked, but the surface soon gave way to cobbles. As she walked along, she noticed a cottage on the right-hand side, with an old chap leaning on the gate smoking a pipe. He wore a collarless shirt and had his sleeves rolled up. Mrs. P nodded to acknowledge him and he nodded back. After this cottage, there was a row of whitewashed cottages with hanging baskets outside. On the left-hand side of the lane, 
There was a circle of country house flowers, nasturtiums, and other cottage flowers. To one side of the circle of flowers, there was a heap of sandstone. Behind this, there was a row of cottages. Alongside these, there was a stable block with an archway. Further on there were more cottages, some built of stone and some built of cheap-looking brick. As Mrs. P walked along, she saw a lady dressed like Mary Ellen, with a high neck blouse, shawl, and black long skirt. She did not appear to notice Mrs. P as she was hurrying into her house. As Mrs. P passed the house, she could feel the warmth from the fire in the range inside. At the end of the lane was a five-bar gate, and a little girl was sitting on it. At the time, the program Little House on the Prairie was popular on the television, and Mrs. P thought how the child was dressed in a similar fashion, as was popular with children at the time. However, Mrs. P noticed that as well as a dress and pinafore, the child was wearing button boots. She thought this was odd, as modern children never went as far as wearing old-fashioned items like this. The little girl gave her a funny look, then jumped off the gate and ran into a cottage. Mrs. P walked up to the five-bar gate, behind which was a grassy slope leading to a meadow. She decided that as this was the end of the lane, she would turn round and take her daughter back home. As she walked back down the lane, the man leaning on his gate was still there, and they both acknowledged each other again with a nod. Mrs. P went home and described to her mother how she had found the old part of Thingwall and how pretty it was. A couple of months later, the opportunity arose for Mrs. P to take her mother to see the cottages. However, when they arrived, the path was no longer cobbles, it was all tarmac and paving slabs. The cottage where the man had been leaning on the five-bar gate was now boarded up and almost derelict. The stone cottages had gone, replaced by two semi-detached houses. The circle of flowers and the stable block had also vanished. At the end of the lane, the five-bar gate no longer existed, and down the dip was now in a state of bungalows. Mrs. P remarked that whilst houses were built quickly nowadays, there was no way the entire area could have changed so dramatically in just a few months. About eight years later, Mrs. P was involved in a dispute about a footpath. Her solicitor suggested that she should obtain the 1830 tithe map of the area and check the footpath on that. After some difficulty, due to the lack of dwellings on the map, Mrs. P located first Woodchooch Church and then Thingwall Village. Mrs. P was surprised to find that the buildings on the map exactly matched the buildings she had seen that day when taking her daughter for a walk. The pile of rubble she had noticed was actually the remains of Thingwall Mill, which had been destroyed in a hurricane. I have experienced a time slip in Liverpool. It happened in the late summer of 1989, and although it lasted probably less than a minute, I have never forgotten it. I was walking along a residential road I had previously walked down a few times, on the borders of L8 and L17 going away from Smithdown Road. As I turned the corner from one street to another, I suddenly became aware that the street was busy with lots of people in it. Some women were staring at me quite strangely. I then noticed the women were wearing old-style clothes from around the 1940s. Where the houses usually were, there was shops with a man, also wearing old-style clothing as well as the children. I remember feeling a bit sick and disoriented but kept on walking along. At the end of the street was a pony and cart carrying sacks. Then suddenly everything was back to normal. I looked behind me and it was once more a residential street. I went back to the area several times trying to find the shops and they were never there. It was all very strange and I've never forgotten it. So I've only just very recently heard the term, time slip, but it instantly hit home after reading other people's stories. What I'm about to tell you I always assumed just as having recurring cases of some kind of deja vu or maybe some kind of passed down family memory. This might be a bit bizarre, lengthy, and be unstructured slash far-fetched, but I can only detail everything that happened. So around 1996 to 1998, four to six years old, when my family went shopping in town we used the car parks on Benson Street, currently derelict, and Oldham Street, knocked down. After parking we would walk downhill towards Renshaw Street. Me, my brother and sister would all be walking and naturally at that age would be holding either my mom's or dad's hands. About halfway down the road I'd suddenly get a strange disorientated feeling that would spontaneously envelop me, in a flash I would imagine an silhouetted old lady in a room with a spinning wheel. I would then snap out of this back to my family. 
time would begin to go slow and the noise of the city began to fade out replaced by the sound of a distant train getting closer and closer. As I looked down onto Renshaw Street the shops would completely transform before my eyes, buildings would morph to look older slash darker and appear slightly slanted slash skewed, the streets looked grayer as if I wore gray tinted sunglasses. People who were already there stayed, but their clothing changed, I still remember seeing the flat cap slash trilbies with long coats, I don't remember any women and my family's clothing all stayed the same. Before we reached the end of the road Thomas the tank engine would go past right to left as if it was going towards the bombed out church. The train was always the only object ever in color and its noise would get deafening when in sight. Everything would also happen in the same sequence, by that I mean I always felt like my eyes and head would do the same movements as if I was never in control. When the sound got too loud I would put my hands over my ears, my mum and dad would both look at me and I would point and say, look at the train, to the confusion of my parents. I can't remember any shop names, I know the old rapid store was there but I don't think that was in sight but I am certain there used to be a chicken shop on the corner of one of the roads and it would morph into an old run-down building. Once the train passed, a few seconds later the train noise would fade back into city noise and I would slowly start to watch Renshaw Street return to normal as if nothing happened. I remember crying and always being reluctant to ever go shopping with my parents again because I knew this might repeat itself. I couldn't tell you how many times this happened, but I know it wasn't every time but when it did happen Thomas the tank engine would start to change into a more detailed train then over time the train became a tram. One time I remember trying to snap out of it by forcing myself to look up at my dad and he was just faceless. I was petrified and knew not to try that again and just let it unfold. The older I got the less frequent it occurred until I was on a night out with my girlfriend, I was a bit tipsy and we cut through Benson Street on the way to Bold Street. I spontaneously got that feeling again, without realizing where I was. It completely sobered me up and I stood dead still and waited, knowing what was about to unfold. Bear in mind at this point I would have been in my early 20s I began to tear up, alls whilst tightly clenching my girlfriend's hand. The street went completely silent. My girlfriend was stood right in front of me trying to speak, it was as if she had been put on mute using a TV remote, her mouth moved but no sound. I then began to hear the train in the distance. I waited for what seemed an eternity but unfortunately no train came. It was as if the memory wanted to let me know it's very much still alive. I didn't know whether to be happy or terrified as it gave me the validation that what I experienced as a child was real considering it must have happened over a decade and a half ago. I must have unbeknownst pushed the memory to the back of my mind due to the less frequent happenings. During that time I most likely accepted it as just my undeveloped brain manifesting these strange occurrences that never happened. Me and my girlfriend hadn't been going out with each other long and I really didn't want to freak her out but I do remember pointing towards Renshaw Street and saying to her, just wait for the tram. The next day I immediately began to research it online and found a few startling discoveries, such as a tram crash on the junction of Renshaw Street slash Lee Street. To this day I purposely try to walk down those streets in hope that the something would trigger and take me back to those moments however I feel because I expect something to happen it won't.